It is Wednesday, August 10th, 2022, and we've come together at the Four Lakes Church of Christ tonight to study the book of Genesis. We are back to Genesis. We'll be in chapter 13 tonight, so if you want to be turning there, that would be great, and I will meet you there in just a few moments. I would also invite you to join us for worship this coming Lord's Day at 1030 as we get back to our study of the Beatitudes and then at 930 as well. I think this Sunday we're wrapping up our study of 2 Thessalonians, so I'm looking forward to another good class from Caleb on that. If you have any questions about what you see or hear in class tonight, please give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. I'd love to hear from you or feel free to send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com and we'd love to hear from you if you have any comments or concerns or anything that we need to be praying about at the Four Lakes congregation. We would uh, love to hear from you. Uh, before we get to our study tonight, I want to give the reminder that we're planning on having our annual clothing giveaway this coming Saturday from 9 until 1. So 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. this coming Saturday. So we usually do this the second Saturday in August. We haven't been able to do it for a few years because of COVID, but we really hope to be back at it this coming Saturday. We need help with this. Hundreds of local families have been helped with free clothing through the years, and I hope we can continue this this coming Saturday. That is the plan. Hopefully we get enough help to pull it off, and uh, your help is needed. Get in touch with me if you're able to, uh, to do that, but I'm looking forward to seeing all of you this coming Saturday if the Lord wills. Uh, again, we're back to the study of Genesis tonight, the book of beginnings. Moses is the author, at least for most of it, if not all of it, and he writes the first five books of the Old Testament. And last week we were introduced to a guy by the name of Abram in Genesis chapter 12. I think we just saw his name very briefly at the end of chapter 11, but we have a lot more information in chapter 12 about this man named Abram. And so God tells him to leave his home in Haran to go to some unknown place that God would reveal to him at some point along the way, and that God would bless his family and also make his family a blessing to all the families of the earth. Well, as we learned last Wednesday evening, Abram obeys that command, and he travels toward the land of Canaan. And when he gets there, he basically passes through from the north to the south, but due to a famine in the land, he keeps on going all the way down to Egypt, where he pretty much lies uh, telling a half-truth that Sarai is his sister uh, to keep himself from being killed by Pharaoh. And of course, God, though, sends plagues on Pharaoh, and Pharaoh sends Abram on his way. So that's where we pick up tonight with Genesis chapter 13. So let's turn together to Genesis chapter 13, and our first paragraph tonight is Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him, and Lot with him. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. He went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, and the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling then in the land. Well, notice in verse 1, we remember Abram had been down in Egypt, but after getting sent on his way by Pharaoh, he now travels north to the Negev. Uh, that's the desert area between Egypt and the Promised Land, and he's accompanied by his wife and also Lot and everything that he owns and everything that all of these people own. And notice in verse 2, we find Abram is very rich in livestock but also in silver and gold. So it's not just the, the stuff or the flocks that he had, but he also has uh, silver and gold. So he seems to have been pretty wealthy even before leaving Haran. Uh, but the whole incident with Pharaoh certainly seems to have increased his wealth even more. If you remember from last week, Pharaoh was giving Abram all kinds of gifts, uh, almost like an ongoing dowry for his sister Sarai. And so it wasn't just the initial deception, as we noted last week, but every time Abram received some uh, goat or camel or whatever uh, because of his wife, Sarai, he was really continuing that deception. Well, when Pharaoh finds out that Sarai is actually Abram's wife, well, uh, Pharaoh pretty much invites Abram to leave, kind of sends him on his way, but he allows him apparently to keep not only his original wealth, 
but also the wealth that had been given to him by Pharaoh. So Abram then, even in a famine, has multiplied his possessions. And uh, that is certainly an amazing thing to be able to do when the whole world is suffering because of a famine, or at least the area that he was in. Uh, he was still able to uh, come out on top and increase his possessions. Uh, notice in verse 3, he continues traveling north. So he leaves Egypt, he goes north toward the Negev, and then he keeps on going. He ends up where he had set up camp previously, between Bethel and Ai, which is pretty much right in the middle of the Promised Land. And in this place, the text here tells us that Abram calls on the name of the Lord. And as we noted a week or two ago, calling on the name of the Lord, it's not just saying the Lord's name. Uh, this isn't just words that he's speaking, but this seems to be a summary of approaching God on God's terms. So most likely some kind of sacrifice, and I say this especially because an altar is involved. So calling on the name of the Lord is more than just saying, dear God, save me. There's something to it. Uh, starting in verse 5, we are reintroduced to Lot, so we have his name again, and here we learn that Lot is also quite wealthy. So it's not just Abram who's a rather rich man at this point, but uh, Lot also has flocks and herds and a number of tents. And in fact, both men are so wealthy, they have so many flocks, that the land that they're on can't handle it. Uh, the land can't sustain them all in one spot like that. It gets so tense even that their herdsmen start fighting with each other. So there is strife between them. At the end of this passage, we find the Canaanite and Perizzite are living in the land at that time. So if we can imagine this, Abram and Lot are pretty much passing through this area, at least from the locals' point of view. This is not their land. They're, they're just strangers here. They are aliens, we might say. They are uh, strangers passing through this land. Um, but they're in the land that is occupied by other people. And so not only are they surrounded by the local people in Canaan in that area, uh, but their own flocks are also sharing a rather limited area with each other. So they don't belong here and they're starting to get crowded, uh, even to the point that they are not fighting the locals over resources, but they're now fighting each other as well. Uh, in a way, it's kind of a nice problem to have, having so many flocks and herds that you can't really find the land to sustain them. Uh, but it is a very real problem. So something needs to be done about this. They need to go out and they need to find more resources so they can continue. So let's move on and continue with Genesis 13, verses 8 through 13. Our next paragraph here, Genesis chapter 13, verses 8 through 13. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right. Or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley, and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly, and sinners before the Lord. Well, in response to this fighting between their herdsmen, notice Abraham or Abram makes the first move, and he reaches out to Lot with this proposal. Uh, he is concerned about this strife between their herdsmen, and really it's going to end up being between them. It shouldn't be this way. They are brothers. They are relatives, we might say. And so here they are, basically brothers. They are living in a foreign land. They are surrounded by people who probably really don't want them to be there in the first place. And what are they dealing with? Their own people are fighting each other. So we have too many other things to do and to worry about other than fighting one another. And I know this isn't an application that's directly made in this passage. Obviously, this is from the book of Genesis. But don't we see a parallel between this situation and our situation in the Lord's church? I mean, here we are. We're in the world. We don't belong here. We are surrounded by people who certainly do not believe the way we do on, on many issues. And I think we would also say at the same time that our, our mission on this earth, it is too important to waste time fighting with each other. Ideally, we need to be getting along with each other in the Lord's church. We are brothers, as Abram says to Lot. So if I'm fighting with a brother in the Lord over some silly matter, 
uh, then I'm distracted from my primary mission. So if I'm dealing with some tension between me and somebody else, if it's not over some solid doctrinal issue, if it's over a matter of opinion, uh, I don't need to be doing that. I have too much else that I really need to be doing. Now, obviously, some conflict is unavoidable, uh, but really we shouldn't be fighting with each other if at all possible. So I don't know if that's a, an accurate application. I think that it is. I think there's something that we can learn from that here. So back then, Abram suggests a possible solution, doesn't he? So he's the older, wiser man. He is the uncle. Uh, Lot is the nephew. And so Abram's advice as the older, probably wiser man is let's separate and let's spread out a little bit. And so as the older uncle, as the one who suggests this possible solution, uh, Abram, I would say very graciously allows his nephew Lot to choose the land that he would like to take. So do we see what Abram's doing here? Now, this is an incredibly generous offer. A lot of times back in those days, it was the kind of survival of the fittest. If you were the oldest, you were the leader of the, of the gang, you were the guy who got to choose the land. But that's not the way Abram goes with this. So he makes this very generous offer. Lot is allowed to choose first. So you can go to the left or to the right. If you go right, I'll go left. If you go left, I'll go right. And uh, whatever you want, you take it, and I'll just take the land that's left over. Well, in verse 10, Lot looks around, and he notices that the land toward the Jordan River Valley is well watered everywhere. And I find it so interesting that Moses points out this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So it's interesting, we have Moses' perspective on this a few hundred years later. And um, and we have, I would say, I would label this as a, a terrifying preview, right? So it's, it's awful. And Moses knows this is coming. By now, everybody who's reading Moses probably knows this is coming. And now we know what's coming, now that we've read this passage. And ultimately, I think looking back on it, obviously, Lot makes a terrible choice. But we don't know that yet. We're in the middle of this chapter. So if we didn't know what was coming next, we might think, wow, that's kind of cool. He got the good land. Uh, Moses, though, does know this. And so he's writing this account. It's a bit like watching a train headed for a truck that is stuck on the tracks. We are watching it. We can't look away. We know this terrible thing is going to happen. But we can't do anything about it. And that's really what we see Lot doing here. He's just in the process of making an absolutely awful, awful decision, especially spiritually. So Lot, therefore, looks at his choices, and he's there, he's looking at this beautiful, well-watered land, I mean, just like the most fertile land in Egypt, I think there's a reference there about being, uh, yeah, like the Garden of the Lord, I mean, this is like the Garden of Eden, this land is so fertile, so he looks, this is awesome, this is just like the Garden of Eden, it's just like Egypt, the, the land that was watered by the Jordan River. Well, at this point, we're not explicitly told, but it seems pretty obvious that the other choice was probably what? Probably not as green. So if he's choosing one because it's so green, obviously that means the other choice was less green. So not as well watered, not as fertile, uh, not as good for the crops and as good for the, the livestock and so on. So Lot chooses the well watered valley, a lush vegetation uh, just ready to move into. And he chooses the best land and he leaves the desert basically for his uncle. Uh, just kind of a thought question here, something to consider. Um, who should have had the best land? You know, not just Abram making the offer, but who should have had it? You know, he was older, wasn't he? So we've, uh, Abram, obviously, I would say, I mean, first of all, he is older. And the younger nephew, I would say, out of respect, probably should have let his older uncle take the best of the land, uh, just from that point of view alone. But secondly, there's also a good chance that Abram probably has more flocks than Lot. So not only is he older, but Abraham has more stuff to take care of. He has uh, more flocks and uh, more potential, a larger family perhaps in terms of servants and that kind of thing. I mean, he was given all of those flocks by Pharaoh, and we have no indication that Lot was uh, given those things. So Lot, though, he takes the best land. And he leaves the leftovers for his uncle Abram. And which kind of tells us a lot about Lot, doesn't it? Uh, well, this is where we need to note the basis for Lot's decision. He wasn't basing this choice on honor or respect. He wasn't basing the choice on what would be best for his family spiritually. But he was basically making a purely financial decision. This land over here will be better for me 
financially. So no regard for the morality of it whatsoever. That was not in the picture. He didn't survey and say, well, that's a kind of evil place. I don't want to be too close to that. I think I'm going to go there. No, uh, he took the good land because it was good land. That was his motivation. As we apply this to our situation today, I would suggest that uh, when we contemplate making a move, uh, that we look not only at how it may impact us financially, but we also need to look beyond mere dollars to see how this move might affect us spiritually. And I hope that that is, um, I think, a safe application to make from this chapter. I mean, obviously, the, the law and uh, the, the prophets, these books in the Old Testament, these were given to us for a reason. And it seems that there is something we can learn here based on how Lot makes a decision on where to move. So today... Uh, if I can move to either city A or city B, so if I've got an offer from two possible employers, um, I need to consider not just the dollar amount I'm being offered, right? So I need to also consider how this move might impact my family spiritually, how this move might impact the Lord's church. How is the church situation where I'm moving? What am I moving into, not only financially, not just the cost of living, not just the salary that I'm making, not just the quality of the schools and the parks and the recreation or whatever, but I would say top on that list needs to be the church situation. How can I help the Lord and his people? You know, is there a solid congregation there? Do I have plans to establish a congregation? You know, what am I doing spiritually with this move? And so again, I know um, we know some things Lot does not know yet, obviously, at this point. We know the rest of the story here. Uh, but think about how this choice impacted Lot over the long term. Number one, he lost his wife, didn't he? Hate to spoil it for us, but in a few chapters, they're going to flee and his wife will turn back and he's, you know, she's, she's a goner. Uh, also, secondly, I would also point out he basically loses his two daughters in this process, spiritually speaking. They seem to be impacted by the evil city in which they were living. And we'll get to that in a few weeks as well. And I think it'll make more sense once we study that chapter. We don't need to go into all that right now. But I would say uh, at the very least, and really it's, it's the worst possible situation here, his family is destroyed spiritually by this choice of the most fertile land. Uh, even though obviously he could not see that at the time. Well, we have the benefit of hindsight, don't we? So we can learn from Lot and the terrible decision that he made. Awesome decision financially, uh, but terrible decision um, spiritually. So let's not fall into that trap. Uh, toward the end of this paragraph is where we find specifically that Lot moved his tents as far as Sodom. So he moved right in. He just kind of got right up next to that village, right up to Sodom. And we also find that the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. And as we will find out in the near future here, um, the sins that they were committing were obvious. This is not something you had to wait around a long time to figure out. If you went into the city of Sodom, it would have been obvious quickly. This is not a place where I want to move uh, with my family. But that was not his consideration at this point. Well, let's conclude tonight with Genesis chapter 13 by looking at verses 14 through 18. Genesis 13, verses 14 through 18. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. So Lot makes the best choice according to some worldly standards, but who really makes the right choice here? Obviously, Abram made the best choice. Abram basically takes the leftovers. But as he settles in, in the leftovers, God speaks to Abram and he reaffirms the land promise. Basically, look around in all directions. I'm giving it all to you. I'm giving this all to your descendants. And we learn here that God will make his descendants as numerous as the dust of the earth. Uh, God then invites Abram to take a tour of his new land. All of it is yours, for I will give it to you, God says. And I failed to include this in tonight's lesson, but I think there are a few other uh, passages later on in the Old Testament that indicate uh, this was a common practice. When you bought a piece of land, you would walk around on it. 
And often the sandals that you used to do the walking, it was like a, like a home inspection. You would use those sandals then as part of the transaction. And so there's some kind of ceremony to it. And that seems to be perhaps the origin of this. So I'm giving you this land, walk from side to side all around it. And everything you walk on will be yours kind of idea. Well, Abram then moves his tent to the oaks or uh, near the oaks of Mamre in Hebron and builds an altar to the Lord. And I just find it interesting that we have no such reference concerning Lot. We don't find that Lot moves in and builds an altar and thanks the Lord and that kind of thing. Nothing like that. And so that seems to indicate that Abram is obviously more spiritually minded than Lot is. Obviously he is. And by the way, we don't know this yet, but Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Rebecca, and Leah, I believe will all be buried in the cave of Machpelah, uh, right outside of Hebron. So this is where he first comes into contact with this as kind of a more of a permanent dwelling, uh, at least for the, the next few chapters here. So this is where we leave it tonight uh, with Abram and Lot splitting up, Lot heading to Sodom, and Abram settling basically in the wilderness, but with God's blessing. I'd much rather be living in the wilderness with God's blessing than in some awesome city with the best of meals and all that without God with me. Uh, so a significant change has taken place here in Genesis in chapter 13, and this choice Lot makes tonight will have some serious implications over the next several chapters. But I think the application for us is let's be careful as we make decisions concerning where we settle. And it's not just financial, but we need to consider the Lord's church in our plans. We need to consider the spiritual condition of our uh, own family in our plans. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930. Again, we're going to be wrapping up our study of 2 Thessalonians. And then 1030 for worship, we'll continue looking, I think, at the third of the eight Beatitudes. And I hope you're making progress on memorizing those. So that's kind of our, our homework assignment, I guess. But uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of Abraham, and you are a God who makes and keeps his promises, not because we are so good, but simply because you are faithful to your word. Thank you for making us a part of your kingdom, the church, and thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer tonight. In Jesus we pray. Amen.